Hello everyone, welcome to the channel, I'm DC. Okay, so today we're going to have a look at the sugar papers. Okay, and this is a lot of research that was done by Kristen Kearns. Now, the video we're going to watch today is her presentation at a CrossFit conference. Okay, this was some time ago, uh, about five years ago now. Um, so why, you know, it's not more popular, I don't know. Uh, I guess you can all make a guess at that yourself. But, um, you know, Kristen Kearns, she was, at the time she did this research herself, she was managing uh, dental clinics for Kaiser and researching the link between gum disease and type 2 diabetes. And she came across, like, the CDC's dietary recommendations for diabetics and brochures, you know, showing... Um, how people can manage the disease by and their glucose by increasing fiber and limiting saturated fat, but it made no mention of sugar. So this obviously made her quite curious, and she decided to go into uh, a lot more research focus into the uh, sugar industry's practices. So. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, and thanks to Greg and the CrossFit team for inviting me and being so interested in my work. Really pleased to be here. Let's see if I can make this work. So yes, I want to give you a little bit of my personal backstory to begin with. And I was working at Kaiser, as Zoe mentioned, uh, although I was on the administrative side. So I was actually managing dental clinics for Kaiser. And we were really interested in medical dental integration. Type 2 diabetic patients show up in the dental office and there is the opportunity for dentists to maybe measure blood glucose and partner with uh, Kaiser physicians in managing type 2 diabetic patients. So I went to a dental conference looking at the links between gum disease and diabetes back in 2007. And I was given this brochure, Working Together to Manage Diabetes, and this was designed for dentists in particular. And I noticed that the diet advice, this is what it said, uh, to manage type 2 diabetes, you should increase fiber, limit saturated fats, and salt. And that's what would help control blood glucose, blood pressure, and cholesterol. What's missing? What's missing from that statement? Nothing about sugar. <laughs> There's nothing about reducing sugar. So that was a little unusual. Uh, and this was put out by the CDC, our National Diabetes Education Program. There was a second keynote speaker at this conference, and he handed out this guide, his Stop and Go Fast Food Guide to Nutrition. And one of the, the drinks that he gave a green light to was Lipton Brisk Sweet Tea, which has something like 56 grams of sugar. Uh, this, this was him, Stephen Aldana. I actually <laughs> chased him down. He was trying to leave and get out to catch his flight and said, you know, how can you possibly give this drink uh, a green light. And his answer was, there is no evidence linking sugar to chronic disease. And I was literally speechless because we were at a dental conference, you know, tooth decay is the number one chronic disease in children. You can't deny the link between sugar and tooth decay. I really had no words and he just turned around and walked out the door. So I, that's not what I expected to learn at this dental conference. And so at the time, I had also been reading books by Gary Taubes, who we've heard a lot about here today, as, we're, as well as Marion Nessel, her book, Food Politics. And if you don't know Marion, she has an amazing blog called Food Politics and has written something like 15 books on the topic. But in her book, she was talking about how the sugar industry had uh, worked to lobby the US dietary guidelines. So I got really curious about the sugar industry and I wanted to know more. So I'd come home after work and just start looking at online. Who is, who is the sugar industry and what are they up to? And this is a screenshot from the website of the Sugar Association from back in 2007. So here they're boasting that sugar had been subject to scientific scrutiny. Uh, over a thousand studies had dispelled the links between sugar, diabetes, hypertension, behavior problems, and obesity. And then here they're listing these government reports, the FDA, National Academy of Sciences, that supposedly also had exonerated sugar from being linked to chronic disease. And this is how I felt. What is going on with these reports? Um, I just, 
again, I just couldn't believe what I was reading. I, I was almost thinking, did I learn something wrong in dental school, you know, about links between sugar and disease? I started really questioning things. So I got rid of cable TV and decided I'm going to just do this after work and I'm going to start really digging into the sugar industry and figure out what's going on. After a year, I quit my job and started doing it full time. Uh, at this point, I'd moved back to Colorado and I was picking up some books at our local Denver Public Library and I typed sugar into the library catalog and records to the Great Western Sugar Company popped up. So this is a sugar company, Sugar Beet Company, that based in Denver, Colorado. They went out of business in the 1970s and decided to donate company records to local libraries in Colorado. Apparently, lawyers did screen through these documents, but uh, a few boxes on nutrition and nutrition policy slipped through. And I just happened to be the first one to go up and take a look. So the very first folder that I opened had this exact document with the Sugar Association's letterhead across the top, confidential. So I knew that I was on to something good. This is how I felt after I found <laughs> those documents. So what I had stumbled upon, uh, the collection at Colorado State University was a collection of photographs, actually. And they kept some of the textual documents to give context to the photographs. And so this was the photograph that was key. This is a picture of uh, J.W. Tatum there on the right, the president of the Sugar Association, accepting the Silver Anvil Award, which is given by the Public Relations Society of America. It's like winning an Oscar if you're in the public relations world. And they won this award in 1976. And so I had all the documents kind of supporting what went on with this public rela relations campaign. But I didn't know how I was going to get the story out because I was a dentist. I wasn't a journalist. I wasn't trained in research. You know, I didn't know how I was going to write about this. So I actually kind of chased down Gary Taubes. I sent him an email and he didn't write me back. And then I was a little depressed because I thought maybe I, I really wasn't onto something that good. And then he was on a book tour in Denver for Why We Get Fat. And I went up to him after his talk and we got to talking and ended up writing an article together. So we had an article that came out in Mother Jones in 2012. And it was telling the story of this 1976 public relations campaign about that Silver Anvil Award. So this, on the left, this is a uh, report from the Sugar Association's board of directors. I had their financial statements, all the research projects that they'd funded, all their memos going back and forth between the Sugar Association and executives of the sugar companies. And uh, Zoe was mentioning earlier the 1977 McGovern report. Uh, what this one was about was a 1976 Food and Drug Administration report. So while McGovern and his Senate committee were looking at dietary goals, the Food and Drug Administration was actually undergoing a massive review of their list of foods that were considered safe. And sucrose was being reviewed. It had been deemed safe in 1958 without much of a scientific review. 1976 was the first time the FDA was really looking at the evidence to say whether or not sugar was safe. So the industry knew that dietary goals report was going on, but they were more worried about this FDA report. So this article sort of tells the story of everything that they did uh, to influence that report. Uh, Here's a quote from this board of directors meeting saying, the fact that no confirmed scientific evidence links sugar to the death dealing diseases is the lifeblood of the Sugar Association, just to give you a sense for their motivation. Now, obviously you can see, you know, there's, there's a very big motivation for them to uh, hide any kind of evidence that they might find about linking sugar to, the, to any kind of diseases. Um, now I recommend, you know, like sugar is a great, um, or sugar cane, I should say, is great for building materials. And you know, if, you know, I'll, I'll put a little thing up on the screen here from an old '50s movie called Sabrina. You know, um, because it always reminds me of the fact that sugar cane is more of a building material and is not something we should be eating. Okay. Put that thing away, Linus. Look at that. 
Greatest plastic ever made, not a scratch on it. Say, I wonder how this would stand up against a bazooka. Miss McArdle, get General Stanton on Governor's Island and ask if we can borrow a bazooka. Yes, Mr. Larry. You'll fly in a plane made of it, you'll wear a suit made of it, and before we're through with it, you'll probably be able to eat it. We're organizing Larrabee Plastics. Larrabee Construction is ready with the blueprints. Larrabee Shipping has bought nine more freighters to handle the traffic. You mean the wheels are in motion already? That's exactly what I mean. Well, would you mind demonstrating the weight test for Mr. David, please? Oh, Linus, I'll take your word for it. Now, up you go. Now, wait a minute. I want you to see how resilient it is. Bounce, please, ladies. Some plastic, eh? Planning on a summer wedding so we can get in on this year's sugar crop. And uh, the impact of that public relations campaign, 1976, this is the, the FDA report that came out. Uh, the sugar industry was boasting that this FDA report was highly supportive, making it unlikely that sugar would be subject to legislative restriction in the coming years. So this actually was a really crucial report. They did acknowledge a link between sugar and tooth decay, but everything else, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, were all dismissed in this report. So I'd written this article. Now what? <laughs> I knew about UCSF. And UCSF is a place where they house uh, the tobacco industry documents. So all the public documents that came out through discovery, through the tobacco litigation going back to the 60s and 70s, all those documents are online at UCSF and searchable. And there's a research program that's developed around that. And this man on the left, Stan Glantz, I don't know if any of you know him here, but he's really been a pioneer uh, in studying the tobacco companies. And he re received the first boxes of, of tobacco industry documents back in the 90s. And he and his colleagues wrote this book, The Cigarette Papers, kind of explaining what was in these documents. So I really wanted to go to UCSF. So I used that Mother Jones article to reach out to Stan and say, hey, you guys interested in what I'm doing? And it turns out they had read the article kind of the same day, and Stan was getting ready to email me. Uh, and he invited me to come give a talk, and that led to a fellowship at UCSF. So when I showed up at UCSF, I had uh, four different collections of sugar company documents. So that one at Colorado State, big one at University of Florida, another one at U University of Illinois, uh, and then another one at Harvard. And Gary actually helped fund me. I was driving around the country, going to these libraries and uh, photocopying all of these documents. And then just to give you a sense for how many collections we have now that are in the UCSF library, we've identified quite a few more, uh, and even some in Vancouver in BC as well. So I've focused mainly on the sucrose industry. And this map gives you a sense for uh, the sweetener industry in the US. So the yellow is, is corn. The corn industry is important as well. The red is sugar cane. And the green is sugar beets. And the little dots are various places where we refine sugar across the country. And I think the sucrose industry is important because historically, sucrose has been the major global sweetener and they've been around the longest and they've been in this game the longest. So much of what I've done has focused on this particular industry and in particular on this trade, trade association, the Sugar Association. So they're based in Washington DC. They're a 501c6 company. Their mission is to promote sugar consumption and they do this through scientific programs, public relations, education, and public policy. And the Sugar Association really dates back to at least the 40s and really it goes before that as well. 1943 was the year that the cane sugar and the beet sugar industry started working together. Before that, they were competitors. So in 1943, they started working together. And they were first known as the Sugar Research Foundation. And they've evolved in all kinds of different ways. They were international to begin with, but they really went international in the 1960s. And now there's the World Sugar Research Organization that's based in London, and the US version, the Sugar Association, and these are all the World Sugar Research Organization members all over the world. So all the countries that have any kind of a cane sugar or beet sugar business all have uh, a membership in this World Sugar Research Organization. And Coca-Cola has been a member on and off, as has the International Life Sciences Institute. 
And this is just a screenshot of our food industry documents archive as it is now at UCSF. You can just Google industry documents library. So we've got our tobacco collection. We actually also have a drug pharmaceutical collection. We have a chemical collection, which Carrie's documents are in. Many of the ones that she talked about are there. Uh, and then now our food, food library, which we launched in November 2018. So I'm going to just give you some of our highlights, uh, some of our papers. Uh, some of our key findings, but actually one thing I want to point out is now with all these different um, libraries online, they're also cross-searchable. So you could type in sugar and something from the tobacco industry might pop up. And this is an example of that. So this is from the Tobacco Industry Documents Library. This is Robert Hockett. He was the Sugar Research Foundation's first scientific director. He worked for them between 1943 and about 1952. The date of this letter is 1954. This is the year that the tobacco companies started to get very nervous about the links between smoking and cancer, and they hired Hill & Knowlton, a public relations firm, to help them be part of the solution. And they made this big announcement in newspapers all over the country in 1954 that they were going to form this thing called the Tobacco Industry Research Committee that was going to help, you know, improve health. You know, but really we know that they were casting doubt on the links between smoking and cancer. So this letter Robert Hockett wrote to the Tobacco Industry Research Committee, and he told them that 10 years ago, a very similar organization, the Sugar Research Foundation, was formed to investigate charges that refined sugar is a primary cause of diabetes, tooth decay, polio, B vitamin deficiencies, and obesity. And then he had organized and directed research projects in medical schools, hospitals, universities, and colleges, which had exonerated sugar of most of the charges that had been laid against it. And then he went on to say that the problems of the cigarette industry are so similar to the problems of the sugar industry that I believe that I could do good work for you. And indeed, they hired him, and he became their assistant scientific director. So it could be that the sugar industry was in this game even before the tobacco industry. So uh, a couple of our papers here. So this was the first paper uh, that I wrote with my colleagues Stan Glantz and Laura Schmidt when I was uh, a fellow. And since I'm a dentist, when I had been working on the Mother Jones article, I kept seeing all these references to tooth decay, which you might hear me say dental caries. That's another word for tooth decay. Uh, and so, you know, I wanted to understand what was the sugar industry up to. I mean, clearly we know the links between sugar and tooth decay, but what, what had the sugar industry been doing in this realm? And uh, so this is from one of their annual reports in 1950. So they actually had a tooth decay research program, and they said the ultimate aim of their foundation was to discover effective means of controlling tooth decay by methods other than restricting carbohydrate intake. So that was pretty clear what they were up to. Uh, I looked a little more closely at some of their studies from 1967 to 1970. And here they were actually also collaborating with the chocolate and confectionery industry. So the money that I saw the sugar industry putting into these studies was actually only 4% of the overall budget. So the sugar industry's contribution was $85,000. But then there's the chocolate industry and the candy industry working together. And some examples of the research. So dextrinase enzymes, the idea was to create these dextrinase enzymes that would break up the plaque on your teeth. So maybe we could add them to toothpaste, or maybe we could add them to foods so that you could eat as much sugar as you want. And if you didn't have the plaque on your teeth, you wouldn't get tooth decay. The other one was a dental caries vaccine. Maybe we can vaccinate for tooth decay. And they dumped a lot of money into this. In fact, people are still trying to come up with a vaccine. This is never going to happen because it's not just one bacteria that causes tooth decay. It's a whole multitude. I guess I don't even know where to begin with that one. I they even want to try and vaccinate against tooth decay now. Um, with everything that's been going on the last few years, and now they're trying to, uh, you know, well, we won't go into that because of the algorithm, but uh, you know what it's like and you know what's going on. And, uh, you know, there's, they, they create a problem and then tell you they've got a solution for it. And here we go again. Anyway, so this is an example of the type of research uh, that they were trying to promote. 
And then we also found that this time period is actually real, really critical for research related to tooth decay. So our National Institutes of Health has a dental institute. And in the 1970s, they announced this program called the National Caries Program. And this is a clip from the New York Times writing about this program. And the announcement was, we're going to halt tooth decay you know, within a decade. And actually, how often do you hear that? We're going to end obesity within a generation. We're going to end this in a decade. So here they're saying we're going to end tooth decay within a decade. And uh, so I, had, I actually found that the sugar industry was quite interested in this program and cultivated relationships with NIH leaders, pulled together you know, their own research to inform uh, the research priorities, and in fact, sent them a report. So the left-hand side is the sugar industry report on what they thought the research priorities should be. And on the right, are, this is the document that the NIH put out and their final research priorities, and I compared the two. So 78% of the sugar industry report ended up being incorporated into our research priorities for tooth decay in the 1970s, and much of it was verbatim. So here's a quote on the left side, but since it's not practicable to replace sucrose in our diet, can anything be added to mitigate its cariogenicity? That just means make it less uh, cavity causing. Phosphates are a possible answer. If it's not practicable to replace sucrose in our diet, can anything be added to the diet to mitigate its cariogenicity? Phosphates are a possible answer. So I was just blown away by this, that the sugar industry's report would be incorporated into our dental caries research priorities. This is our federal funding agency influencing what people are researching in this field. And uh, all the non-dietary intervention research was really de-emphasized. And this is actually a really critical time period because that FDA report that I mentioned where it did acknowledge a link between sugar and tooth decay, uh, that could have informed advertising restrictions. So in the 70s, the Federal Trade Commission, they were actually really looking at trying to limit advertising of sugary breakfast cereals to kids. But the main health reason was tooth decay. But they needed some sort of an objective way to determine what breakfast cereal causes cavities and what, which doesn't, which cereal is safe, and how do you tell? And that's the research that the NIH could have done, but that's the research that got de-emphasized by this National Caries Program. So I got to understand what, why the sugar industry really cared about tooth decay so much. So another paper here now looking at heart disease. So actually, oh no, this is still my dental care study. So really the conclusion here, just sort of focusing the research on non-dietary interventions as a means to prevent tooth decay. So switching gears to some of their heart disease projects. So the next paper I looked at, I wanted to understand why the sugar industry was funding heart disease research. And they really got interested in this area in 1965. And they uh, funded nine different projects, spending about uh, $700,000 uh, in today's dollars. And that first project was a literature review. So I decided, okay, let's dig into that and see uh, what they were up to. And we heard a little bit uh, from Jim about the diet heart hypothesis in the 1950s. This is when the evidence was coming out linking saturated fat uh, to heart disease and the idea of the low fat diet was really gaining traction. And this is the president of the Sugar Research Foundation talking to a group of sugar beet growers talking about uh, an economic opportunity that he saw in the low-fat diet. So if the American public switched to a low-fat diet, this change would mean an increase in the per capita consumption of sugar by more than a third. So they were getting very excited about the potential of a low-fat diet back in the 1950s. But they weren't really doing much uh, in heart disease research at that point, they, but they were watching very closely. So. Uh, Vice President John Hickson of the Sugar Research Foundation started to notice an uptick, uptick of research starting to uh, question the role of sucrose in heart disease. So between 1962 and 1964, he reported that from a number of laboratories of greater or lesser repute, there are flowing reports that sugar is a less desirable dietary source of calories than other carbohydrates, in particular coming from Professor John Yudkin. 
Okay, so they were getting excited about a low-fat diet back in the 50s. And, you know, when it came here in Australia, like in the late 70s and early 80s, everything that went low-fat, everything is low-fat and fat-free and all that sort of BS garbage, it skyrocketed in sugar. Even dairy, like it became illegal to sell raw dairy in Australia. So then um, everything had to be pasteurized and all the rest of it. And then when the low fat came in, they added sugar to the dairy stock. So if you bought like skim milk or low fat milk and all that sort of stuff, check the sugar content. It's huge. Okay. They still weren't quite ready to act until 1965 when there was a surge in media attention. So it was the media attention that really um, was a big factor. So this article came out in the New York Herald Tribune, which was a competitor to the New York Times that's not around anymore. And it was a big uh, two-page spread on studies that had come out uh, in Annals of Maternal Medicine. And it was talking about briefly, it may be the sugar you eat rather than or in addition to the type of fat in your diet that increases your risk of heart attack. Up to now, the sugar hypothesis had been mainly theoretical, supported by only a few studies. So what these new studies did, in the past, uh, the biomarker that was of most concern was total cholesterol, serum cholesterol. These new studies started to suggest that we needed to be concerned about triglycerides as a biomarker. And these studies showed that overconsumption of sugar could cause uh, elevated triglycerides. And so these were the studies that the sugar industry was getting very nervous about in the 1960s. So what did they do? They commissioned a literature review. Mark Heg Hegstead was their major um, the lead of the study, and he at the time was at the Harvard School of Public Health. His mentor was Fred Stare, who was also a consultant for the sugar industry. Uh, but Hegstead was the one that corresponded back and forth with the sugar industry. And in Hegstead's uh, archives at Harvard, it contains the correspondence going back and forth. And so we were able to see uh, that they paid Hegstead $6,500, about $50,000 in today's money. They corresponded back and forth at least 24 times on this literature review. Uh, and sugar industry was able to see drafts. So this is the vice president saying, let me assure you, this draft is quite what we had in mind. And we look forward to its appearance in print. And this ended up being a two-part uh, narrative review. So this was before the meta-analysis days. So it's a narrative review of the literature linking sugar to coronary heart disease versus the literature uh, linking saturated fat to coronary heart disease. Uh, and if you're interested, I basically spent a year of my life going through the studies that were evaluated in this paper and uh, assessing them for bias. Uh, and there's a massive supplemental file that goes along with this paper that'll give you all the details uh, on, on what they were up to. But, Ultimately, their conclusion was that the low-fat diet uh, was the healthiest diet for heart disease and that saturated fat was the enemy and that we should switch out saturated fat for polyunsaturated fat. And they did it in a very biased way. Uh, and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, obviously a very prestigious journal coming from the Harvard School of Public Health. And interestingly, they did disclose some funding from the Nutrition Foundation, which is an industry funding group, but they did not disclose the funding from the Sugar Research Foundation. Uh, but, you know, this is the 60s, and so we didn't have the rules like we do now with conflict of interest, but it is interesting that they would choose to uh, disclose one source of industry funding and not the sugar industry's funding. And what's key about these researchers, Hegstead and Stair, is they went on to be very influential in the U.S. dietary guidelines. Um, so post-1977, the next round was in 1980, and Stair was on the group you know, that reviewed those dietary guidelines that was very lenient on, on sugar. Uh, so, yes. Ultimately, what did we find? So they accentuated the inherent uncertainty of the studies linking sucrose to coronary heart disease, while they overstated the certainty of the body of evidence linking saturated fat to coronary heart disease. 
So this also gave the sugar industry something to cite. So anytime they were talking to policymakers, they could cite this incredibly influential two-part literature review in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, so the third study I want to share with you is another heart disease study. After I did the lit review one, I got very curious about some of the studies where they were comparing uh, starch to sucrose. And one thing I should point out in that New England Journal of Medicine review, uh, it wasn't just human studies, they were actually looking at animal studies as well. And uh, the authors dismissed animal studies as being relevant to making any kind of a policy decision for humans. But interestingly, the sugar industry then went on to fund their own animal studies. So I'm like, huh, okay, I wonder what they were up to. So I looked at uh, Project 259, which they called the effect of dietary carbohydrate load on blood, lipo, blood lipid level in germ-free rats. So back then, uh, the technology to be able to study uh, rats that did not have a gut microbiome uh, had just been developed. They were very expensive and complicated studies, uh, and they still are, but uh, the sugar industry was really interested in this, and they wanted to feed rats high sucrose versus high starch, and do this with rats that had a normal gut mi bi microbiome, and do it with rats that didn't have bacteria, and compare them and see if there was a difference. Ultimately, what they found was that there was a link between the bacteria in the small intestine. And so to get that triglyceride response in the rats, you had to have the bacteria in the small intestine to get the triglyceride response. So in essence, what they were doing is proving to themselves that there was a mechanism to explain the link between sugar consumption and elevated triglycerides even though they just paid the Harvard guys to claim that triglycerides were not a relevant biomarker and that there was no plausible mechanism to explain the relationship. So this was a two-year study uh, that wasn't 100% completed. So the lead researcher, uh, Walter Pover, uh, was updating the sugar industry periodically and he wrote to them saying that he was really close he just needed something like 16 more weeks and needed to extend his funding. And the sugar industry considered that and amongst themselves, they were ranking the projects that they'd been funding in heart disease and uh, ranked Pover's project as having nil value to the sugar industry after getting those initial results. It wasn't going to be supporting the PR message that they were really interested in. So they did not give him that extra funding and his results were never published. So this is an example you know, of the sugar industry exploring for themselves these plausible mechanisms and then keeping it to themselves. When we published this paper, a reporter, several reporters contacted the sugar industry for their comment. And they actually said, well, gee, if, if Dr. Kearns had just contacted us, we would have given her some more documents that could have helped explain kind of what we were up to. And they actually gave this reporter this one document. And I asked him, I said, did you actually read what they gave you? Because I think it made their case worse. So here's what it said. It says, this is them talking amongst themselves. You know, of interest are the human implications. It could be that those people showing extreme sucrose-induced hyperlipemia are harboring an atypical intestinal flora. Uh, so an example here of what did the sugar industry know and when did they know it? Uh, the results suggested that gut microbiota might have a causal role in carbohydrate-induced hypertriglyceridemia. And I actually forgot to mention another finding. So they had an incidental finding as part of the study. Uh, they were just sort of looking at all different kinds of things that they could measure in these rats. And they looked at uh, the urine. And they found that there was a difference in beta-glucuronidase between the high starch-fed rats and the high sugar-fed rats. And uh, beta-glucuronidase had been linked to bladder cancer at the time. Uh, and so they were also talking amongst themselves that, oh, isn't this interesting? We found this bladder cancer biomarker related to a high sugar diet. And uh, the regulations at the time 
certainly the results would have strengthened the case that uh, the CHD risk of sucrose was higher than starch, but also it was, would have been likely that sucrose might have been scrutinized as a potential carcinogen, because this was the time period when the FDA was also really looking at artificial sweeteners. And there was an artificial sweetener, a class of sweeteners called cyclamates at the time, and it was the bladder cancer results that were the most definitive uh, in linking cyclamates to uh, bladder cancer. And so had these bladder cancer-related sucrose results been made public, the FDA might have scrutinized sugar even more heavily. So just want to give you an idea of the impact of some of these studies. So we've gotten a lot of media attention, which has been wonderful. So uh, some of our research results have been picked up by the New York Times, you know, made it in newspapers all over the world. Uh, so it's wonderful to get those messages out to the public. But it's also had an impact in places like the World Health Organization. So this is Dr. Margaret Chan. And she actually quoted our work uh, when talking about public-private partnerships with the food industry and uh, policy-making organizations like the World Health Organization. But we're not quite there yet. When we talk about the tobacco industry, the tobacco industry is no longer invited to the table in places like the WHO or the UN. Uh, but the food industry still is. We still talk about the food industry as being part of the solution. Uh, that we can't make the changes that we need to make without working together with the food industry. Uh, and well, you know, the food industry, that's a really big term. You know, the tobacco industry, it's much easier to kind of single out tobacco companies. And the food industry is, is very broad. But I, I think that, you know, it's fair to say that the sugar industry, the sugary food and beverage industry shouldn't be at the table, but they still are. National Academy of Sciences, I had the chance to uh, be part of a talk looking at trust in nutrition science. It was actually an education to me to really understand that the National Academy of Sciences really isn't a federal agency. It's, it's a private organization and it's also heavily funded by the food and beverage industry. So there I was at the table for this particular event and I'm sitting there with all the representatives of the food and beverage industry. Uh, and this could be one explanation by some of those Institute of Medicine reports that have exonerated sugar. If you look at the sponsors, they are sponsored by companies like Mars, for example, the global candy manufacturer. Uh, I've also now had the chance to work with some collaborators on a series in The Lancet looking at oral health and getting more serious about the links between sugar and oral health. You would think that dentists would be out there leading the charge, but we're not. Uh, the American Dental Association doesn't support soda taxes. The American Dental Association is still waiting for more evidence to take action on a policy standpoint. We're fine with doing dietary counseling, you know, in clinical practice, but when it comes to really standing up on the policy level, we still have a long ways to go. And I know Rob's been working with some dental organizations and we're starting to, to see some action, uh, but we're not as active as we should be. And so this, this Lancet group is actually really exciting because this whole series looked at a lot of things having to do with oral health, but it really looked at the sugar industry and what we're calling now commercial determinants of health. Uh, and so this really had a focus on commercial determinants of health and there will be a, a now a commission going forward uh, that will be doing more research and getting more serious about taking those on. And then um, I also just participated in a side event at the United Nations uh, related to oral health, but here just sort of to demonstrate dentistry kind of being stuck in the mud, you know, we had global leaders from oral health there and we had a panel, we had panels on both sides, so pro-public-private partnerships and against public-private partnerships, and you can guess the side that I'm on. And I was together with Mary Nessel and uh, Nina Renshaw from the NCD Alliance and Cheryl Hilton from the tobacco world. And people from my own profession were calling us conspiracy theorists uh, and challenging us and, and you know, well, just saying some not very nice things. And it's really kind of disheartening to see that. And so when the dentists, you know, when the most visible health effect of sugar uh, aren't up there leading the charge, then something's really wrong. 
Uh, so where am I going next? Just to give you a sense for how much more there is to do. This is just looking at the Sugar Research Foundation and their public health projects that they sponsored between 1943 and 1972. Uh, number of projects, so just on nutrition, 11, cardiovascular disease, 9, 15 different tooth decay projects, 8 different diabetes projects, etc. And these all led to hundreds of publications. There's over 300 publications that came out. And I've really only written about a handful of these publications. So there's much, much more to do here. And now that these documents are online, anyone can look at this. And so hopefully, if this is something that you're interested in and you want to know more, you'll take a look at the archive for yourself. Okay, so that's Kristen Kearns. You know, she did the original research on this stuff, so she knows what she's talking about. And like she said, these papers are online and archives that you can look up for yourself. It's all verifiable. Um, a great presentation. And like she said before, it seems that see, a lot of um, what we knew before, or I, what I thought before, was that especially through the the 80s and 90s with the anti-smoking campaigns that came out tobacco industry sort of pretty much took over sugar and you know um then you know the sugar industry obviously uh, started taking on the same sort of advertising and and false research uh, funding and all that sort of stuff but it seems that the sugar industry was doing this much earlier and perhaps even around the same time or even earlier than the tobacco industry was um, as well. So, um, yeah, very interesting. And obviously you can see that these corporations uh, fund these so-called governing bodies and so-called um, organisations that are supposedly trying to help people, such as the Diabetes Association. And that's why you find, you know, on their website, you know, for diabetics, you know, cakes, cookies, and all that sort of stuff, recipes, and that sort of um, absolute junk food. Um, so, again, uh, they have always put the blame on saturated fat and, of course, meat, uh, meat consumption, because, you know, they are all tied to the um, cereal companies like Sanitarium and the rest of them, the Seven Day Adventists at have been pushing the vegan diet since you know for the last 150 years and um yeah of course the you know one of the big lines was here in australia like how is sugar bad for you it's natural yeah but, but so is saturated fat and you know animal fats and uh eating meat and it's been more net it's you know it's been natural to eat meat for the last four and a half million years and uh, it's got us this far and without it we wouldn't have the cognitive function that we do now so um this is well worth having a look at i will put some links and sources in the description and uh, i hope you guys enjoyed this one and got something out of it and i'll see you again soon bye bye